Well, we'll get to that. Well, we'll get to that. And then we'll get to that. We need to get into this locker here beside the bed, and as Madnar said, we have the key. The brooch that Gustave gave us. It's made of a shape memory alloy. It's a material that changes shape at different temperatures. And to get it to change to the shape needed to open this locker, we have to go to the freezer in the mess hall of the soldier barracks, and while you're there, you can also go to the sauna to get it to change to another shape, which opens this locker here for some bullshit you won't use. And all of this is back on level 4 of building 1. Ugh. Okay, so once that's done, we need to... Hey, wait, how did I get back here? Open the locker, there's nothing in here. But there's a hole at the back, and... What the fuck is that? Oh, Jesus, it's like Vermintide in here. Johan, what the fuck is going on? Poisonous hamsters. Yeah, I mean, fuck it, why not? You lure them in with the rations that contain cheese, of course, so that you can shoot them all en masse. And I mean, at this point, the question of whether Snake is a good person isn't really up for debate. Because even Big Boss, as bad as he is, tried to save the animals, you know? Once they've cleared out, you can safely pick up the cartridge with the microfilm inside, and crawling back out, Madnar stops you. Holy shit, dude, you're still alive? I must have been gone for like more than an hour in game. Have you just been dying on the floor this whole time? I'm still not helping you, but that is impressive, I have to say. He tells Snake that Big Boss won't let him go, that he will use Metal Gear to destroy him and the world, but Madnar wants a better world for his daughter, one that presumably doesn't have a few radioactive craters while being under dictatorial military rule. So he tells Snake how to destroy Metal Gear D, and wouldn't you know it, its weak points are its legs, which can be taken out with a few grenades. I don't even have to do them in a specific order this time, huh? You're getting sloppier in your old age, Madna. But where is Metal Gear? I've covered every inch of this base, and this was the end of the line, so what do I- Snake isn't a good person, and he does deserve this. Maybe I deserve this. Are these really his choices, or is he simply an instrument of my will? Where does Snake end, and where do I begin? What is being a good person? Is it following orders, regardless of the things those orders brought? Would I act any differently if I were actually there myself? What separates a soldier from a common killer? Am I any different to a man twisted by technology and indoctrinated by ideology? Am I any different to an Olympic runner terrorist? What is right? What is wrong? What am I even doing here, truly? Where am I going? What's happening to me? Where am I going? Oh, here I guess. Grey Fox is calling Snake out from inside Metal Gear, talking shit about how he's gonna show him true fear, and man, you thought that the first Metal Gear was a disappointment? Metal Gear D may actually be the worst Metal Gear of them all, if only because we never actually got to see the TX-55 in action and see what it was truly capable of, having taken it out while it was still inactive. This thing is fully functional, primed, and piloted, and it's still the lamest fight in the game, and yeah, I'm including those two chuckle fucks in that statement. The whole thing is over in 30 seconds, more or less, and would barely be worth mentioning if not for the fact that this is meant to be the titular threat. You fight in a room that's just weirdly barren compared to literally every other screen in the game, and I'm going to assume that this is in part because of the ROM limit that Nishio kept hitting while designing Metal Gear D. And look, I don't want to shit on another person's work, especially not someone who has likely accomplished more in the span of development for this title alone than I will in my entire life. But how the fuck did that happen? No, really. How did this blow out the game's memory limit? Let's do a rundown of what Metal Gear D is equipped with. A 16mm rotary cannon, a 5.56mm machine gun, and a missile pod capable of being loaded with multiple types of warhead, and that's it. By comparison, the TX-55 was much more heavily armed, though it should be noted that if Snake runs into the Metal Gear D sprite at any point, it's an insta-death, so for fairness sake, let's say that this one is also capable of stomping a dude to death. And sure, unlike the TX-55, at least the D's full arsenal was put into use, but it's genuinely one of the least active of all the bosses. Its entire fight pattern is to walk backwards and forwards. When it reaches the back, it'll fire missiles, and when it reaches the front, it'll fire a gun. All you have to do to beat this thing is stand off to the side and just throw grenades at its legs for a few seconds. No, seriously, why were we afraid of Metal Gear again? 
Metal Gear D actually does more harm to you in its death throes, setting you on fire, but more specifically, it sets your stuff on fire, which is burning you. And the distinction matters because as the Colonel will call to tell you, you have to throw all that shit away. The card keys, your rations, which you don't throw away, I guess, you just smash them down on the spot. I guess the fire basically makes them like mini warm meals. All this shit you probably didn't use, and even the bandana if you have it. Not that that last one matters so much, since you've already lost all your weapons at some point, maybe they fucking exploded and that's why you're on fire. I mean, it's plausible, I've taken mines to the face before, it's fine. Grey Fox flees the scene, running down to this room over here, which... God, I hope that's normal mannequins. You enter into a darkened room because Grey Fox has a flair for the dramatics. He's laid a bunch of mines around the room, that's what those dots were, and wants you to go hand to hand in what Snake calls a chicken fight, and a cursory google search of that term has probably placed me on a list somewhere. Fox has clearly been waiting for this, he wants to fight Snake, and like every other member of Fox Hound, he seems to have a weird fixation on the animal thing. Castler calls you, and I guess Grey Fox is happy to just wait a moment and let you take the call because it's not a short one. He gives a rundown of Grey Fox's details, including his real name, Frank Yeager. He was was the last member of Foxhound to hold the rank of Fox, and that's important, apparently, because Fox was the highest rank you could achieve in the unit. So I don't know what that makes Snake, but it's obviously not the best Snake, you underachieving piece of shit. Castle says that knowing Fox's past might help Snake out. It doesn't help him in the fight whatsoever, Castle just wants to gossip. Ten years ago, Grey Fox was a mercenary known as Hunter. Yeah, it should be clear where this is going by this point. Grey Fox, aka Frank Yeager, aka Frank Hunter, is the man that Gustava fell in love with and tried to defect for, but when someone in the West deemed it politically inconvenient for her to cross over, she was denied. It's at this point where Frank began to hate the politicos and presumably signed on with whatever crazy bullshit Big Boss had in mind. Then, Castler says that if you beat Frank, he'll tell everyone that Solid Snake is the greatest mercenary in the world and holy shit man, work that shaft just a little harder and so close. By the way, this is how the fight with Frank goes. Maybe the problem with Metal Gear D wasn't Metal Gear D. While bleeding out, Fox says that while Big Boss may have just been another CEO to Snake, which, whew, that is a spicy take. To Grey Fox, Big Boss was a literal lifesaver from a time before he even joined the Foxhound unit. Big Boss first rescued him from the forced labor camps, which he was being sent to due to his being half white in Vietnam during a time when that was an unfortunate thing to be. He says Big Boss saved him from that living hell, just like all the children here in Zanzibar land, which, yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. The second time Big Boss rescued Grey Fox was while he was fighting for Renamo in Mozambique, but not before he'd been captured, tortured, and had his ears and nose cut off. Yeah. Snake asks if this is Fox's way of repaying Big Boss, but Fox reveals that, in fact, he hates war, just like the kids here, which makes sense. Instead, he says he needs war, and then he starts saying we in reference to his argument, which makes it unclear if he means Big Boss and I, or he means the him and the kids he mentioned earlier, so keep that in mind. Considering this was originally released in 1990, this is some heavy shit to be putting into a video game. Then he says that he was never able to make a woman happy, which, oh boy, I mean, I'm an open-minded dude. I think we should be able to talk about these things, but I also think there's a time and a place, and I'm not sure spilling it all out during your dying moments to the guy who's killed you is either the time or the place. Worse still is that Snake picks up on this, and it feels like there's a brief moment of realization that Grey Fox knows he killed Gustavo, which is... Holy fuck, dude. Snake tells Fox to rest easy, knowing that Snake won't turn out like him. And that's an admirable sentiment, Snake, but you're probably one bad plot twist in a relationship away from also killing someone during a mission. In one final twist, Grey Fox also let slip that he was your number one fan, the one calling you this whole time because he felt bad? Dude, your motivations are so fucking weird. Also, we should just take a moment to acknowledge that, sure, the explosion of Metal Gear D probably did some damage, but Snake just beat Grey Fox to death with his bare fists. And then he explodes. Grey Fox drops the cartridge with the microfilm inside, and then before you can do anything else, you're immediately called out again. Dude, come on, what is left after everything we've... Oh, yeah, alright, I suppose you were gonna turn up at some point. Alright, fine then. Hey, asshole, long time no see! Snake reveals that, yes, I was right. He totally had PTSD and has been having night terrors about out of heaven for the past three years, which, hang on. Okay, before we go any further, I have a few things I need to get off my chest about this game story.
A slight correction to what I said a few episodes ago, because heavy drinking while script writing is great for your word count, but not always for everything else. Operation N313 took place in 1995, not 1994, so with Operation F014 taking place in 99, that leaves a gap of four years. But Snake says to Big Boss that he's been having the nightmares for three years, so putting aside the idea that something terrible must have happened in 1996, this is obviously just a continuity error, but it bugs me that they would have known the official timeline for this already, since the localization for this game came well after Metal Gear Solid, where the retconning for these two games was established. If Snake has been having nightmares for years because of the Outer Heaven incident, why does he think killing Big Boss is gonna help with that? Snake didn't even know Big Boss was alive before this mission. His survival came as a genuine shock to Snake. Did Snake just decide somewhere in the last few hours that killing Big Boss would fix everything? Why do the bosses always just seem to give you a timeout while you speak to your support team? I can see how Metal Gear D could have raided one nuclear site. <laughs> Maybe. But how did it raid all of them around the world? How was it getting around so quickly? Was there no resistance at all? The world was giving up its nukes, not disbanding its armies. Did no one notice the big fucking robot sneaking around? Hey, isn't it weird that NATO committed war crimes and that never gets brought up again? Why did Madnard design Metal Gear D with the same vulnerability as the TX-55 but without the sequencing that model had? That feels like a massive step backwards for the robot design overall, and surely Big Boss would have noted the weakness as well. Was Madnar incompetent, setting up insurance for himself or in the process of trying to become a triple agent? How is Big Boss okay with this? How in the actual fuck did Big Boss not only survive getting repeatedly rocket launched in the face, but then proceeded to rescue everyone on base and exfiltrate them to another country? He was missing limbs. Surely that would have slowed him down. How was Gustava able to stay hidden for so long? Sure, she pulled off a convincing masculine physique to match Zanzibar land soldiers, but she did some stupid shit, like go into the women's bathrooms while dressed as a male soldier, in an army with no female soldiers, and hung out in the sauna where she would have presumably only been wearing a towel and anyone could have walked in on her. Hey, isn't it weird that Zanzibar Land's male-only military facilities have a female bathroom? Also, why does it have saunas? How did Madnar not manage to get the info needed about the key out of Marv, but still know exactly what he needed to do later on? Was he just working the whole thing out as the conversation wore on? Was Snake just his rubber duck? Why was Madnar trying to interrogate Marv when they had no shared language? Was Madnar just expecting Marv to hand signal the Oilix formula? Wait, 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 hang on, one more thing. What the fuck is going on with those mannequins? So, back to the final showdown, Big Boss reassures Snake that the nightmares will never go away. And that's a dim view to take, Big Boss. Sure, PTSD is a harrowing illness that was once seriously misunderstood, but we've come a long way from those dark days of just ignoring those who deal with mental demons. It might be fair to say that the pain of his experiences will never go away, but with the right medication and treatment, one day the nightmares might very well cease. Then Big Boss starts talking about the children you've seen around Zanzibar land, how they're all victims of war, and how they'll all make fine soldiers in the future. That's right, all those children he rescued from out of heaven, all the kids he rescued here, none of it was altruism. Big Boss just wanted to raise a new generation of soldiers under his command, and what better way than to indoctrinate the orphans from a war you yourself perpetrated? This is all part of his larger philosophy, you see, creating wars that create new soldiers by happenstance to then feed into future wars, a grisly machine of carnage in order to perpetually sustain conflict, because the battlefield is the only place he can truly live. If that sounds like horseshit to you, then good job! You're not a genocidal freak, and we can continue to be friends in the pretend way you do with YouTube personalities. Civi, please look at me, senpai. I want you to notice me. You have no inventory aside from the cartridge. No weapons. What are you supposed to do? If you call Kassler, he'll tell you that after the fight with you and out of heaven, Big Boss lost both hands, both feet, his right eye, and his right ear. Somehow surviving, he was taken in by an eastern Block despot who put him into Madna's Snatcher program, which resulted in him becoming a cyborg. Okay, maybe I do need to look into that game at some point. Castle also says that if this is true, then you're fucked and you should just give up, basically. And just settle down, Castle, okay, mate? You said the same thing about Night Fright, who I fucking murdered. And not 10 minutes ago, I cleared the extremely low bar to become your mercenary husband for life, so I feel pretty confident in telling you to go fuck yourself. Here's how this fight goes. One of these eight doors can be opened from the beginning without a keycard. The rest have to be opened 
open with a specific key card that you can find in the other rooms. Around the arena are three chocolate rations, which are disgustingly not for eating because you'll need them to MacGyver the acid pools, one of which is in front of one of the doors you need to enter, and the others are just on the inside of a couple of the doors, so if you don't have the rations equipped when you enter those rooms, Snake will just walk straight into them and melt. That means going all the way back to the sweat box you fought Grey Fox in, waiting for Big Boss to taunt you and open the doors, and then having to sit through the cutscene again because, like I said, many firsts for the series were established here in Metal Gear 2. The point of navigating the card key room puzzle is to pick up the hairspray and the lighter. You can probably work out where it's going from here. You can't hurt me, Big Boss. Because I'm protected by the god of hair cat. If you try to actually catch Big Boss front on, he'll easily get a few shots in, and without rations, that shit is gonna add up quick. Instead, what you want to do is lure him over to one of the obstacles around the room, wait till he passes across the other side, and then hit him with the flamethrower. If a jet stream of fire can pass over the top, I have to assume bullets can as well, but Big Boss doesn't even try to do this, so maybe there's some blanks in his brain they forgot to fill in with robo bits. Hit him enough times and he ignites, flailing around the room, screaming your name. That this isn't over, and I mean look, he's charred harder than Running Man was, and then he explodes. But that's not the first time I've seen that happen, so I'll just settle for, he won't stop me from escaping. Head up to the top of the arena and the door opens for you, and five steps in... It's Holly, who I'd forgotten was still hanging around. She rendezvous with Snake and immediately makes a comment about how the military uniform was too tight in the chest. Hmm. And then she hands you a gun she says she stole from the enemy, to which Snake replies he can see how to be hard for a woman to use. It's a fucking pistol. Many firsts. There's some more conversation that amounts to what Snake believes to be human flirting before he calls in the retrieval chopper for him and a blonde with a cute face. God damn it, Kojima. The pair of you begin sprinting down the corridor, and of course there's guards waiting for you as soon as you get down the hall, so it becomes a chase as well. You actually move faster in this section, so the enemies don't really pose a huge danger. You can just run right past them. But you also have infinite ammo during this point, so... Up the elevator, out into the jungle, and when you reach this clearing, Snake pulls out his radio to berate the pilot for being so late, making a joke about being here till Christmas. Haha, <laughs> that's some fucking boomer humor right there. Which I mean, Snake was born in 72. Maybe he was the kind of guy to unironically laugh at newspaper comic strips, you know? More guards flood the area, and if you run around, you'll find a pit trap even here because these guys respect the old ways. What the? How are you doing that? And after you kill enough of them, you'll run out of ammo before being surrounded. But wait! Here comes Charlie! Snake turns to Holly and drives the jerk into the ground, asking if they'll be home in time for Christmas. And despite her refutations, he keeps on about Christmas dinner. Okay, I think Snake might be having an episode. And that's it! You board the chopper and then fly away into the credits. Okay, there is one more thing. Campbell, Snake, and Holly meet for a debrief, with Campbell immediately pressuring Snake into coming back to the unit. Snake says no in so many words, saying that the nightmares have stopped, which might be true, it's hard to tell exactly how long after the events of the game that this scene takes place. They confirm that the cartridge is, in fact, what Marv says it is. They do this by actually loading the cartridge into an MSX, which I guess Foxhound just had lying around, and identify it as a hat cart definitely owned by Marv, because he changed the KB readout in the bottom of the MSX splash screen. See? While Campbell and Holly marvel over this, Snake quietly slips out, presumably to return to a quiet life in the wilderness, because God knows that polite society wouldn't accept a murderous, child-bashing, womanizing soldier like him. Fuck, did... did Big Boss have a point? So, what just happened? Firstly, Big Boss being a cyborg? That actually happened. It's mentioned again in the database for Metal Gear Solid 4, so yeah, Big Boss survived our fight... somehow. And while missing several appendages and a 
fucking eye, he rounded up a bunch of surviving Outer Heaven forces and war orphans and got them out of the base. This will be retconned again later for something even crazier, but we're nowhere near there yet. Outer Heaven was then bombed back to the Stone Age by NATO, who would have known doing so would constitute a war crime seeing as there were surrendered forces, resistant fighters, and fucking children still on there. But resettling war victims and dealing with imprisoned enemy combatants is difficult, and so Outer Heaven was bombed anyway. Snake then retired from Foxhound, while Big Boss dragged his group of survivors across the globe, attracting the attention of some third world despot along the way who helped Big Boss to cyberize himself, which may or may not have been Madnar's doing. The newly minted Big Boss then oversaw a conflict called the Mercenary War, which only really seems to be mentioned in the Japanese version of the game and manual, which is weird because it's what directly led to Big Boss taking over Zanzibar land and it should probably get its own game. Also, the whole the world was de-arming their nukes thing? Yeah, that never actually happened and in fact the whole nuke situation becomes way more complicated as of Metal Gear Solid. So, for now, it's safe to assume that some nukes were being held back by respective world governments and instead of being the sole nuclear threat in the world, Zanzibar land would have just been participating in the age-old blood sport of brinksmanship with the world's other nuclear powers. During this time, Madna became a double agent for Zanzibar land, bringing scientific secrets to them from both east and west because at this point, Madna is in it for Madna. He just wants to finish building Metal Gear for reasons. Somewhere over the next few years, Czech scientist Kiyo Ma developed Oilex, a low-input, high-yield way of extracting petroleum-grade oil from algae, and during a time when the world was beginning to feel the sting of an oil shortage. That's a real thing, by the way. Around the time Kojima would have been writing this, there was a program run by the US Department of Energy that was researching exactly this, petroleum-grade oil extracted from algae. Long story short, it was doable, but by the time they could actually produce it, the price of natural oil had gone way back down, and algae fuel was way more expensive to produce by comparison. Then, in the 2000s, when oil prices rose again, there was renewed interest in alternative fuel sources, and as recently as the 2010s, there have been some actual retail sales of algae fuel. I'm not saying that makes Kojima some kind of profit. Algae oil obviously didn't become the world-changing technology he thought it would be. You know, because of the Illuminati-like cabal of corporate interests who secretly control the world and sometimes my dreams. But you have to give him and his team some credit for their research and foresight. Swimming in the same scientific circles, Madna got in touch with Marv and arranged for the two of them to travel to the US for a conference. For security, they were escorted by Gustavo Hefner, former Olympian skater turned ruthless STB agent, which didn't really help a lot seeing as they were all captured by Zanzibar land forces while in the US. Equipped with nukes and holding the best hope for humanity's energy future hostage, there was no way for a conventional army to intervene without causing massive collateral damage. Enter Foxhound, now under the command of one Colonel Roy Campbell, who brings Snake out of retirement for one last mission. Infiltrate Zanzibar land and save Kiyo Marv. While infiltrating the base, investigative war journalist Holly White just casually calls you because I think it's fair to say your radio was compromised from the outset, which might have something to do with infiltrating the base run by the guy who used to run Foxhound. Maybe we shouldn't be using the same equipment, codes, and protocols established by the very dude we're hunting, Colonel. Holly is... there, I guess. She serves a plot purpose later that honestly could have been filled by anyone, but otherwise doesn't do anything important and literally never comes up again in the series after this game, so yeah, I'm not even really sure why I'm mentioning her. Though she does rightly point out that Zanzibar land is full of kids who just wander around the base unchecked because that's just how Big Boss rolls. Snake is also called by a mysterious somebody throughout the mission, feeding him information about his surroundings. During the mission, Snake encounters Kyle Schneider, now Black Ninja, a mercenary working for Big Boss in defense of Zanzibar land. He didn't die during the Outer Heaven mission like we thought he did when he was yanked off the radio before he could tell you about Big Boss's true identity. That was some time before you destroyed Metal Gear, so he didn't die in the resulting explosion of the base either. So did did Big Boss go around the base collecting people before fighting Snake? Or did he just send goons around the place rounding everyone up while he was facing off against you? The true answer is actually way weirder. And I don't even fully understand it. But again, that's not explained for another six games or so. So right now, my current accepted headcanon is that Big Boss had the foresight to get everyone rounded up in advance of fighting you. And then while you were making your daring escape up the wrong ladder, Big Boss crawled his way out of the base on fucking stumps in the same amount of time. Even I have to admit, that's pretty fucking fucking badass, but you can see how I'm not convinced he's still dead, right? Either way, after delivering the killing blow to Schneider, but before he actually dies, he spends a long time, like longer than is reasonable for a dude that's just been shot a dozen times, revealing the whole NATO war crimes thing to Snake. Snake was apparently unaware of this and seems pretty shocked, but gets over it pretty quickly and it never gets mentioned again in the game. Snake would also find Madna being held captive on the base, and learn from him that not only was Big Boss still alive and running Zanzibar land, but that Metal Gear D 
has been built and is operational. Snake would later learn about one of Mars' carrier pigeons on the roof of Zanzibar Tower from Holly. Oh yeah, I guess that's also why she was around. From which he gained Marv's frequency. Marv doesn't speak English though, and there's a whole thing where Madna tells you to do something unsavory in order to find Gustavo, which you do, and together you find Madna. He says he'll take you to find Marv, but instead betrays you and Gustavo, leading you to Grey Fox, who then promptly blows the fuck out of the bridge and then Gustavo. No way, that didn't come out right. Snake manages to get past the destroyed bridge anyhow, dodging mercenaries left and right, and finally arrives at Marv's room, but not before Madna choked him to death. Holly outs Madna as the treacherous bastard that he is, and he finally spills the beans about his status as a double agent for Zanzibar Land, and how he's been trying to extract the location of the Oilix plans from Marv. He and Snake struggled briefly before Madna succumbs to a terrible case of explosives. Snake retrieved the video game cartridge that the Oilix plans were stored on from Marv's nearby locker. Then, with his dying breaths, Madna tells Snake how to defeat Metal Gear D, which Snake promptly does, before then moving on to, allegedly, kill both Grey Fox and Big Boss in back-to-back one-on-one showdowns. That's fucking awesome. Snake and Holly escape via Chopper from the jungles just outside of Zanzibar Land, bringing the cartridge containing the Oilix plans back to Colonel Campbell in America. But then Snake slips out again, returning to the Alaskan wilderness. The Colonel, I assume, continues to run Foxhound, and probably enjoys a certain amount of prestige from a successful-ish mission. Marv is confirmed dead, while Madna, Big Boss, and Grey Fox are also presumed dead, as is Kyle Schneider, but for reals this time. And here's a list of characters you'll never see mentioned by the games again, ever, at any point in the timeline. Holly White, Johan Jacobson, George Kassler, Keo Marv, Gustavo Hefner, Big Boss's rinky-dink mercenary cavalcade, and the children of Zanzibar Land may God rest their souls. As far as Metal Gear games go, this one is right up there in terms of quality. You've got conspiracies within conspiracies, giant robots, just the strangest shit being treated with full sincerity. Mwah, it's wonderful. It's a little old and janky at times, but nowhere near as bad as the first game. All those ones I try not too hard to think about. Next time, we're getting into Metal Gear Solid, where Snake goes up against a dreaded foe that struck down many of his contemporaries at the time. The Z-Axis.